Hello there again, Chris. Um, I wonder if we can pick up uh, in a way where we left off, which was starting to talk about um, how the agenda then started to uh, develop within other parts of the UK. Um, of course, by the time we got to um, 19, uh, to 2000, uh, we'd seen devolution in Scotland and Wales to a greater degree, and they had national governments effectively with devolved powers. How did those two countries start to re re respond to the agenda? Um, yeah, on the whole, the more local that you got, the better the response to the agenda uh, became. Um, so individual cities uh, seized it uh, with, um, uh, with a lot of uh, determination. The regional development agencies uh, took it up. Um, the devolved nations, um, particularly Wales, um, uh, really uh, understood the, uh, the agenda and uh, saw, I think, um, uh, the uh, area around Cardiff and Swansea as being uh, uh, a potential hub for, um, uh, for the creative sector. Um, uh, Scotland perhaps slightly less so, but still better at responding to it than um, the uh, Westminster government uh, of the UK had been. Of course, Scotland sought to make one very specific institutional change, which was to abandon the concept of an arts council and move to an organisation which they called Creative Scotland, which um, encompassed both film and the arts, and uh, had in that sense that wider remit. Would you have liked, were you, were you happy to see that? Would you have liked to see that approach develop elsewhere, including in England? Um, in England, uh, of course, the Arts Council did take on uh, a bit of responsibility for film, um, but it didn't have the wider creative remit that, um, uh, that Scotland had very specifically given to uh, what they called Creative Scotland. Um, uh, some particular regions of the Arts Council, however, took things into their own hands. I remember the West Midlands um, uh, uh, region of the Arts Council uh, deliberately started to develop a creative industries fund, uh, which they used to invest in small startup uh, creative enterprises um, in a really rather imaginative kind of way. Um, uh, but that was their initiative rather than something coming from the central body of the Arts Council. But, that, I mean, uh, but it struck me as well that places like Manchester and indeed uh, Northwest Arts at that stage, which was based in Manchester but covered the whole of the Northwest region, they seem to be very much on the front foot as far as this agenda was concerned. They seem to, I mean, Manchester had already uh, developed its uh, creative, creative Industries Development Service since which was working with the creative industries very, very quickly, um, working across the piece. Um, and, but it, there did seem to be something of a divide. So the north of England, to my mind, seemed to be more um, on board with this than, for example, the southeast or um, the east of England was. You are you completely right in that. Um, uh, the, the, the two uh, really dynamic hubs for... Uh, uh, the creative industries um, at uh, that time were Manchester and Sheffield. Um, and um, uh, the, for them, it was really, really important. Um, uh, and um, meanwhile, um, even London, uh, which you would have thought would have uh, been the place to seize this uh, agenda wholeheartedly, uh, even London didn't really get going for a while, and certainly the areas of the south and southeast outside London um, uh, really um, uh, didn't put very much effort into it. Do you think that was primarily down to the fact that they didn't feel the need because they felt economically secure, whereas looking at the North and the Midlands, actually there was a lot of work still to be done there, uh, in terms of addressing post-industrial declines, certainly in cities like Sheffield and Northumberland and, and Newcastle and, um, and Manchester and Liverpool. And they seem to all be very early centres for that engage with this agenda. Uh, uh, yes, and I'm sure you're right that uh, one of the driving forces was the loss of traditional industrial sectors 
they really wanted to um, uh, uh, look to developing new forms of uh, economic development and here was something that um, they could uh, seize on and uh, begin to to uh, to grow and of course one of the critical uh, tools that areas like that had which had fallen to hard times was the fact that they had uh, access to European funding and that seemed to me very early on to be a key uh, tool that was being used by many of these places I think SIDS was, fun uh, was funded through it originally um, and there were many initiatives which seemed to be come off the back of the fact that European regional development funding was actually available in one form or another and they were able to access it and it gave real impetus to what they were trying to do when other parts of government didn't necessarily have the money to invest. Again, absolutely right. The um, uh, European regional development funds were, uh, were key to uh, uh, bringing um, uh, creative industry development uh, uh, into the um, um, uh, areas uh, uh, like the Northwest and Northeast and Yorkshire and um, uh, it's um, uh, it, it, it is of course uh, now a matter of uh, infinite sadness um, that um, uh, Britain is no longer going to be part of Europe and part of what uh, European uh, uh, development funds could be used for. I could agree with you more, but that won't surprise you. <laughs> I think that's a, a view which is held by, held by many people within the sector. Um, can I just shift over and, and um, talk now about cities and uh, local government in the UK? Obviously, the city councils tended to move into this space more quickly. But did you feel there was a, a real sense of, sense of this being something which was understood at more district levels, the lower levels within, within uh, in terms of the size of the authorities within local government in the UK? Was this something which they naturally started to take up? Um, uh, I, I think it was both at um, uh, officer level and at uh, political level in uh, local government that um, the people really did begin to seize uh, this agenda and run with it. Um, uh, the, um, uh, we, we had identified in the work of the task force uh, a number of key areas uh, where uh, the creative industries needed some degree of support and intervention from the public sector. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we, we realized quite rapidly that they didn't need, uh, except in one or two areas of traditional uh, artistic activity, they didn't need uh, cash handouts from, um, uh, from government, but they needed support. And um, uh, the, the four areas in particular that we identified no, five areas in particular that we identified. The first was the importance of education and sustaining creativity through education in order to prepare people to enter the creative sectors. The second was trade support uh, internationally, something that uh, really only a national government can, uh, can give. Uh, Thirdly, um, the uh, uh, was access to finance because traditional uh, bankers did not speak the same language as creative entrepreneurs and trying to bring the two together and marry their interests together um, uh, was important. The fourth area was um, uh, access to workshop and studio space um, and that's where uh, local government really uh, was able to uh, make a difference uh, and the fifth was protection of intellectual property rights so there were some areas like intellectual property rights and um, uh, education and trade where um, national government was going to be really important but there were other areas like access to finance and access to space 
um, where uh, more local government or local organizations could make a difference. And it was those things that uh, uh, local government really uh, seized on and did some very good work on. I'm just, just looking at the whole question of funding and access to funds. I mean, it's always struck me as being uh, strange in a way that uh, people look to the Arts Council um, for funding in the way that they had traditionally done. And uh, didn't really seem to understand that that always came with certain requirements, that you, you were expected to check boxes in doing what you were doing to meet the needs that are there. And in that sense, it wasn't free money in, in, in a way, it was directing what you did. And I remember having a conversation uh, some years later with um, uh, a leading um, investor who said, you know, it is only when artists actually are successful that they're able to really be free in terms of what they're able to create and produce because then they're spending their own money. I, uh, I, I, I remember having a conversation um, uh, with the great uh, theatre director, Peter Brook. Uh, he was on one of his rare visits to London. He had left the UK, he'd gone to France, he'd set up the theatre at uh, the Bouffe du Nord in Paris. Um, and I can remember asking him, I said, what, what would it take for you to come back to, uh, uh, to Britain in order to run a theatre and put on theatrical work? Uh, and he said, well, let me put it this way. Um, uh, every year, at the Theatre of the Bouffe du Nord in Paris. Uh, I get a brown envelope, comes through from the Culture Ministry. Inside is a cheque. Uh, uh, I use the money that, uh, that comes with that cheque uh, to uh, run the theatre and to put on work for the whole of the succeeding year. And that is the last that I hear from the culture ministry, he said, until a year later, another envelope arrives with another check in. And he said, if you could guarantee me that sort of, uh, 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 of operation, then I would come back to the UK. Now, of course, um, in, um, in Britain, uh, that would just be impossible with all the checks and balances that uh, are in place for any publicly funded operation. Um, and um, so sadly, off he went back to Paris. Um, just going back to the local government level though, how quickly do you think it was that they really started to start to develop their own policies and strategies at that local level? I and mean, what sort of level of knowledge and understanding? I mean, how do you think that filtered down to them, that level of knowledge and understanding? Because it wasn't as if there were large scale training programs around it. I remember we did some work with the local trade agencies very early on back in, it must have been 1999, 2000, um, a, a program called Ready to Export. And they were, many of them were totally at sea. They did not understand the concept at all. And when it came to the notion of giving advice to creative businesses, they simply couldn't find the language to avoid coming over as being patronising. Um, I think most local authorities sort of learned by doing. Um, uh, you're right, there was no training programme in place. There was no template. There was no uh, um, uh, instruction from government about here is how you go about doing it. Um, uh, they were aware that this work on the promotion of the creative sector of the economy was going on at government level, but uh, they were by and large responding to uh, creative entrepreneurs on the ground in their locality and trying to work out ways of doing something that would help them. Um, and uh, where that uh, help took a particularly useful form was in the provision of workshop space. Um, uh, because one of the interesting features of creative businesses is that whereas most other businesses want to be far apart from their competitors, 
um, creative businesses want to be in clusters with other creative businesses. And uh, very often they'll spin off ideas from each other. And um, uh, that uh, was a uh, really good way of um, um, uh, getting the message through to um, uh, local authorities, creative businesses saying, we want you to take over this old warehouse and turn it into studios, uh, which we can rent at a reasonable rent uh, and be next door to other creative businesses and share some administrative services with them. And um, uh, many local authorities really took this opportunity by the, the scruff of the neck and did it. But it was, it was a bottom-up process. What about the university sector? I wanted to ask you about that because I can see that in some quarters that, that, uh, that in many quarters, that's become really important in terms of developing the creative economy today. But back then in 2001, um, certainly when we were starting to look at doing work overseas and taking this innovative policy concept out of the UK and sharing it with countries. And of course, the first place we did that with was Colombia, that it was very, very difficult to survey the space of university engagement and find the right partners to be able to take overseas and to work with people overseas, because there was still to some degree a, um, a reluctance to uh, get on board with the idea, or it certainly seemed to be. There was a lot of criticism of the concept, a lot of um, going back to looking at the first mapping document and complaining about that, rather than really understanding that it was a concept and the reasons for you having taken the steps and done this in the way that you did? Um, universities, I think, uh, took, uh, took a while to come to the table. In those early days, you're right, um, there wasn't much engagement by universities. Um, we had, of course, uh, secured the help of um, um, uh, City University in London to do the second mapping exercise, but they did it as an academic exercise uh, rather than as a university devoted to helping the um, development of the creative sector. Um, uh, one or two universities began to get involved quite early on. King's College London, for example, um, uh, really did um, uh, seize the, uh, the idea and take it forward but in quite an academic way. Um, it, it wasn't in those days very much of a sense of uh, universities working with the creative sector to, um, uh, to, to drive uh, creative enterprise forward. I know, I, I mean, it struck me as being very interesting because I remember that we tried very, very hard to find the right academic partners at that stage. and. We didn't find it difficult to find them in some quarters. So, for example, when it came to conversations with the University of the Arts, there were parts of the University of the Arts in London which got the agenda straight away. So looking at, for example, London College of Fashion, they were very, very quickly on board and talking about the same sort of things and understanding it in the context of their sector. And if it was a sector-based approach, you would find, I think, greater buy-in. But what we were trying to do was find people who were able to look at this from the economic perspective as well. And that was actually very, very difficult at the time. Um, and we succeeded in doing it in terms of the University of Leeds, which is who we brought out first of all to, to Columbia and who worked with uh, Los Andes in, in, in Columbia on that first mapping project back in 2002. Um, but I can see that, that actually if the university sector had been um, more engaged from the outset, it might have made things easier in terms of building the evidence base because you would have that ability to review, to evaluate, to interrogate uh, far more kind of readily in place than, than, than we had at that stage. And particularly it would have helped if we'd had some serious economic work being done yeah. academically uh, on this. Um, I mean, it was uh, it was very pragmatic stuff that um, uh, that we were doing in those early years and particularly even with the second mapping document, um, yeah, this was going out and counting rather than um, 
uh, really doing a, a profound economic analysis. Um, uh, gradually, um, uh, as the rest of government began to uh, with all of this, and it did take quite a number of years, um, uh, gradually it grew in importance and significance and um, uh, now it's sort of unchallenged as a, uh, a, as a, a serious part of what government is about. But it's interesting because back then there was, I think, still a residual issue, um, certainly as far as academia was concerned, around the question of definition. Because I know at the time there were people who were saying, well, what industries aren't creative? Because anything which involves innovation is surely creative. Um, and similarly, some people harking back to that notion of, well, this is about culture and therefore how can you put an economic value on culture? Um, and I know in the first kind of um, engagements that we had, for example, with the United Nations, with UNESCO particularly, it was really important, and indeed with UNCTAD, it was really important to be able to talk through with them the fact that this is not just about economics, it is about the broader picture that's there, but in terms of a, a, a tool for economic development and for um, uh, uh, social development in societies, it's such an important one that it really does need to be given emphasis. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And um, uh, the, one of the points that I kept on making to, um, uh, to the rest of government, uh, and indeed when I've gone around the world talking to other governments who want to um, uh, take a serious look at the creative sector of their own economy, is you will only get a uh, really viable, vibrant, successful, creative economic sector commercially if you have a strong artistic traditional sector uh, out of which that can spin. So um, uh, you, will, you will not get successful film uh, technicians and directors unless you have a strong theatre sector uh, where they can cut their teeth. You will not have uh, uh, brilliant commercially successful uh, music makers unless you have really good music education in schools and uh, strong support for traditional orchestras and, and so on. You can multiply the, um, uh, the lesson, but you need that strong traditional artistic engagement and uh, support if you're going to be able to get the, uh, the commercial benefit from uh, the broader economic activity that it will eventually give rise to. We spent a lot of time, I remember, in those very early days, uh, kind of um, having to deal with an argument which was about creative industries versus cultural industries. And it felt increasingly semantic rather than really about um, moving anything forward and having that momentum behind it. And so we very early on, I think it was in about 2000, then tell into 2000, ditched the creative industries and moved towards talking about the creative economy. Of course, John Hawkins then in about 2001, published his first book looking at the creative economy. Do you think that that change in terminology was important in terms of getting wider acceptance, in terms of getting wider traction as far as the concept was concerned? Because it was in a way shifting away from talking about the arts in terms of industry, but at the same time was talking about it in a far, far more holistic way in terms of an economic agenda. Yes, uh, some, some of the cultural critics of what we were doing, uh, the people who still couldn't see that um, uh, aesthetics and uh, economy were marching hand in hand, um, uh, some of those uh, early critics um, uh, always talked about either the cultural industries or the arts industry, um, rather than even using the creative industries term, let alone the creative economy term, which is undoubtedly broader. It uh, scoops in 
um, a lot of those design and innovation areas that uh, one wouldn't necessarily instantly think of as being uh, uh, associated with um, uh, the uh, artistic sides of the economy. Um, but um, uh, so I think the, the term creative economy has uh, come to be helpful in this respect. Um, I, I tend to use creative economy and creative industries more or less interchangeably, um, uh, but I have always wanted to talk about creative industries rather than cultural industries. That makes entire sense to me, I have to say. Um, I, one of the areas you talked about before in terms of those five areas was in terms of trade. And that's really how, um, when I was working at the British Com Council, I, I got involved in, in all of this because all of a sudden, um, government, the uh, Labour government was asking the British Council to support the trade promotion agenda. And I know that we were inv invited to join the Creative Industries Export Promotion Advisory Group, group uh, CPAG um, acronym, um, which was being run jointly by DCMS and the UK Trade Agency, uh, which was part of the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, it was a difficult situation the British Council because um, even though we were uh, an organisation working at arm's length with government, the funding for the organisation primarily, they're not entirely came from government. Um, and it, there was no doubt about the fact that we had networks and contacts overseas that could help in terms of uh, building up the, the conversation. But it was very, what, what was really the driver from your perspective in terms of trying to bring the British Council into the trade agenda? Um, I, I wanted the, um, uh, the traditional trade uh, promotion activities of uh, uh, the Foreign Office, um, largely done through ambassadors around the world. Um, I wanted uh, them to embrace this part of the economic agenda. Um, and the British Council were a useful battering ram to, uh, uh, to, to, to try and uh, uh, get a sense of why these things were important. I remember being <clears throat> very struck by two things. One, uh, when I went to Japan and I was talking with the ambassador, the, the UK's ambassador to Japan, um, about trade promotion. And it suddenly dawned on me, he had absolutely no understanding whatsoever about any of the creative sectors of the economy. Um, and uh, so I sort of gave him a masterclass in what they were and why they were important and uh, hopefully enlightened him as a result. Um, and then I, uh, I went to China. This was uh, 1999, I think. And um, uh, it was when uh, the uh, Chinese government were making a decision on who the architect was going to be for the new national theater in uh, Beijing. Uh, and they had boiled it down to two candidates. One was French, the other was English. Um, and um, I discovered from talking to the ambassador uh, that um, uh, Britain had uh, made no uh, approaches to the Chinese government at any level uh, to promote the interests of the English architect who was one of the two finalists for this competition. Whereas the French government, the president had phoned the, uh, uh, the Chinese prime minister, um, the French culture ministry had been lobbying the uh, Chinese culture ministry, um, the ambassador had made representations on quite a number of different occasions. So, uh, my um, uh, meeting with the Deputy Premier, uh, where I tried to um, sing the praises of the uh, UK's architect in competition, rather paled into, 
uh, by comparison with uh, uh, with what uh, France had been doing. And I suddenly thought, you know, if we really were serious about promoting our creative uh, activities and uh, economic activity abroad, then we would be in there lobbying just like the French were. Do you think that um, the that, that engaging with the British Council though was the the best way about going to uh, actually trigger that development within the Trade Partners UK and the trade agencies? I mean, it, it was a, at times a very hard slog to get them to understand the nuances that were there in terms of working uh, with people from the creative sector and taking getting the right people there making the right case getting the right meet the right people um we worked you know and for us it was also difficult i have to say because um obviously many of the people that were wanting to go in terms of working internationally at that stage were looking towards developed economies such as the us and anglophone countries um you know much of continental europe australia canada and the like whereas in actual fact for us as an organization at the time there were certain whilst we had offices there they weren't necessarily large offices in themselves large organizations operations um in actual fact, you found those far more in countries like Colombia or in Brazil or looking at China or India. Um, and, and so we were really, a, we were better placed to start to develop the markets in those contexts or the conversations in those countries. Um, I, I, I just wondered if in hindsight, do you think we could have organized it in a better way? Or do you think in actual fact that it's made a difference in the sense that the, that in the context of the British Council's responsibilities and role, which is as a cultural relations organisation, it actually allowed us to open up a different dialogue with those countries. Um, I, I, I think uh, in involving the British Council was both really helpful for the agenda, uh, but also it was quite helpful for the British Council. Um, the uh, uh, helpful for the agenda precisely because the British Council was much more attuned to the nuances of um, cultural activity, engagement and um, uh, tradition in the various countries around the world than the traditional diplomatic and trade uh, uh, envoys were. Um, and so involving the British Council helped those nuances to be understood uh, and uh, it was a, a very good way of beginning to get a realization dawning on other people that um, uh, there were opportunities here. Uh, but I think it was also helpful to the British Council in that it uh, did more, it went, it enabled the British Council to move a little bit beyond um, the traditional teaching of English and um, um, uh, uh, cultural exchange uh, kind of responsibilities which had been the traditions of the British Council. I, I know when, when I first suggested we should do, um, we should take the mapping concept overseas um, and talk about the creative economy from that perspective, there was quite a lot of kind of eyebrow raising that we should be talking about innovative policy making from the UK. We might do it in terms of education, but it was the first time it had been done in terms of a cultural agenda. So, I mean, I can, you know, I don't have any doubt about the fact that, that um, for me, it was one of the most important things that we were doing at the time. And I think actually with the benefit of hindsight, you can see that um, when it came to um, exporting the concept internationally, the British Council actually played a very important role in that. Uh, that's undoubtedly true. Um, and um, yeah, there's, a, there's a whole host of countries around the world where uh, it's the British Council that have effectively um, uh, persuaded governments to uh, pick up this um, uh, idea and run with it and have provided really helpful um, uh, advice by reference to what happened in the UK to those governments. Well, it's, it's gratifying to know that, that that is your view, I have to say. 
Um, can I just end by just talking to you about the point when you left government and kind of passing the baton on? You left in 2001 and Tessa Jowell was appointed as your successor. For me, it was actually in many ways one of the most difficult period in terms of trying to get traction from DCMS around the agenda, despite the fact it had come out of DCMS. There was so much focus on sport in the context particularly of the London Olympics and the bid for the Olympic, London Olympics. I just wondered, you know, you talked about um, the role of, of the regions um, and the, the role of the British Council. I just wonder, you know, what do you think actually gave it the impetus to continue and to thrive, given that it wasn't really being driven forward to the same degree by the by DCMS itself? Um, it, it wasn't being driven forward by DCMS. Um, uh, they, they sort of uh, dropped their eye off the ball. Um, they weren't particularly interested. Um, uh, but uh, meanwhile, I think two things were happening. One was um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the local government and regional development agency um, uh, organizations that had already seized this and were beginning to work on it, um, that work just continued um, and uh, uh, continued uh, rapidly and well. Uh, so even though national government was no longer pushing in the same way, regional and local government uh, was uh, really uh, doing something serious. At the same time, it was an idea that was just gently germinating inside the treasury. It took them another uh, oh, four years, five years before they, uh, they it finally the penny dropped and they um, uh, understood how important this was. But um, uh, there were at least some people at official level in the treasury who had noticed and were beginning to, um, uh, to, to um, take this forward uh, uh, in a serious way. And that then um, blossomed into a really serious understanding by the Treasury uh, about four or five years later. But there was that follow period when most of the activity was happening at local level. And it was at that stage, wasn't it, when I think that James Pennell became the Secretary of State. And there was a period then of, uh, I think it was two or three um, Secretaries of State who, who came on board. The interesting thing for me, and I, I'd like to talk about this a bit later in the next part of this, is just also the fact that all of a sudden, um, uh, I think it was Ed Vasey who became the shadow working on the creative economy agenda within the Tory party. That seems to have been a moment when in actual fact, both parties suddenly had understood and accepted how important this was as far as not just our economic and cultural future, but also in terms of the way in which we could talk to the world about our nation and our national identity. Um, I just wondered, you know, how important was it for you that it A, got back on track as far as the Labour Party was concerned, but B, that it actually almost became apolitical. It was something which was seen as being actually a sector which was genuinely of value. Oh, I think both things were very important. Um, uh, and D Tessa Jowell sort of paid lip service to it to a certain extent, uh, but, but wasn't really engaged. Um, uh, James Pennell and Andy Burnham and um, um, ben Bradshaw, who um, uh, became um, DCMS secretary towards the end, um, uh, all of them much more interested and uh, uh, sort of helped to get it back on track, helped and aided and abetted by the Treasury by then. Um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, but uh, having the uh, the same um, uh, burgeoning interest uh, happening uh, uh, where the Americans would describe as across the aisle on the other side of the political divide um, uh, was actually enormously helpful uh, because that meant that when the Conservatives came into government in um, 2010, um, uh, they uh, 
embraced the uh, importance of the creative industries, the measuring of the creative industries uh, in a way that um, uh, they certainly would not have done 10 years previously. I will leave it at that for now, Chris, but uh, we'll reconvene shortly. Um, and then, then I'd really like to, be able to talk to you about the whole question of how the creative economy fared during the recession that came along in 2008 and just looking a bit towards the future, if that's OK. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Chris. We're back. So I wanted to now just move on to talk to you a little bit more about the whole issue of the sector and things that happens after you left office. And I particularly wanted to talk about growth because I think it's fair to say that the growth of the sector is something that um, has really um, surprised everybody um, to some degree or another. And I think we've become almost uh, quite used to the notion of the fact that this is a sector which will just keep on growing. Um, but of course, there was a point when uh, one of the things we were all very concerned about was the first test that it would actually um, have to deal with, which was the whole question of recession and how well it would fare during a recession. What were your thoughts about that originally? Did you think this was going to be a sector which would weather a recession well? Or were you concerned about when the recession came, whether or not this might be something that, that faltered? Um, uh, one of the things that uh, from... Uh, looking at the past we had uh, been able to understand was that even at times of economic uh, turmoil and recession, the creative industries appeared from what we could see to have kept on growing. Um, uh, the, um, and what we knew from the studies we were doing around uh, 99, 2001 uh, was that uh, at that time, the uh, creative economic sector was growing at something like twice the rate of growth of the uh, national economy as a whole. And um, it, it, you're right, it did seem at that point as if you know, this is unstoppable, unstoppable momentum. Um, it, 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 this will carry on happening. Um, and indeed, when we got to uh, uh, the uh, recession uh, that hit everywhere around the world as a result of the uh, financial crash in um, 2008, um, the, uh, uh, the creative sector sort of kept on going. It, prob it probably wasn't uh, growing at um, uh, twice the rate of growth of uh, everything else, but it was nonetheless, um, uh, it did appear to be reasonably recession proof. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the sector uh, kept on going and uh, then was in a very good place to take off again when um, uh, things began to uh, get back more to normal um, at the uh, start of um, 2012, 2013. Um, that, uh, I uh, fear, has not been the case now uh, with the uh, recession that uh, COVID has brought. Um, because uh, the problem with uh, the coronavirus recession is that its particular impact has been on anything that brings people together. And um, uh, in order to see a movie, see a play, listen to a concert, visit an art gallery, um, to do any of the traditional cultural activities, you have to bring people together. And um, uh, so the current circumstances we are now living through are really difficult for certainly the traditional cultural sector. Um, that appears also to have had an impact in some parts of the broader creative sector, um, uh, uh, music and um, film, uh, and television, for example. Um, 
uh, it, the uh, economic impact is having a really serious impact on advertising. Um, architecture has probably been able to, um, uh, to struggle on, um, although the construction sector has uh, been fairly severely hit. Um, fashion has certainly been hit. Um, uh, the, uh, if uh, uh, people are not buying goods, then the designing of those goods is going to be more difficult. So the, it, not only do we have the impact of um, not being able to bring audiences together for creative or cultural events, but we also have the run-on impact on um, things like design and uh, software development um, that um, are a crucial part of the rest of the uh, uh, of uh, the economy. So both have been uh, severely affected now, less than ten years ago. I'm just thinking though that it's interesting in a way that um, if you look back to 2008 just a year before that, there was a, another real game changer, which kind of disrupted the sector, which was social media. All of a sudden with the rise of Facebook and Twitter and those platforms, and obviously new platforms have come on since then, and there's an ongoing impact as far as digitization. I mean, in the work that I've done over the past decade, certainly in terms of the change in the market, it is really quite significant, the degree to which people are able to access content in different ways. The fact that they can, they're doing that as individuals rather than in front of a television with their family or in a, a room listening to music with their family or with friends. Actually, it's all about people being able to listen through their smartphones and their headphones. And I can see in the data that you, we've looked at when we've been looking, for example, at emerging economies and the, the development of the market there, it's social media and smartphones that have made or smartphones to make the real step change in terms of opening up those markets to um, the breadth of content that people want to be able to enjoy. Um, certainly in, in countries like Pakistan, where you know women were excluded to some degree in terms of what they could choose themselves to watch or listen to or to read, all of a sudden that, that agenda is, is opening up. And I'm just wondering whether or not um, those changing business models which have come about because of digitization, whether or not actually digitization is one of the ways in which we need to be able to look at how those models will change again now because of COVID-19 and the recession. Because you can already see that whilst television production was interrupted, the television companies, the, uh, the, uh, the TV program makers or the filmmakers are now finding ways of creating their content again. And so um, traditional shows, are coming back onto our television screens at this point in time into the autumn schedules. Similarly, if you look um, at um, the way in which um, other parts of the sector are, are, are able to operate, they're having to rethink it, but by and large, they're able to find new ways of doing it. Isn't that just part and parcel of the nature of the creative sector? It's just the fact that we're living through a particularly tempestuous period. Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, because um, uh, if you if you look back at what happened in the uh, late noughties and the start of uh, the 2010 period um, with the development of social media with the ease of digital communication um, the uh, this was potentially a huge opportunity for the creative sector uh, but it was also a big threat because it disrupted a lot of traditional business uh, models. Yep. I, the most obvious example, of course, is the music industry. Um, uh, previously, uh, the music industry had been riding high on um, um, uh, selling originally discs and then CDs, and um, uh, the uh, relationship with the public was um, a, a very profitable one for those um, uh, bands and um, musicians who managed to hit the big time. Um, suddenly, it was possible to obtain music simply by downloading it. And uh, it took the music industry 
something like 10 years really to understand how this um, uh, could actually be made to work for the benefit of musicians and for the benefit of the industry. Um, now with the development of Spotify and Apple and so on, um, uh, it, it, it's um, uh, uh, something that uh, the music industry has been able to take good advantage of. But for quite a number of years, they were really struggling. Their old business model was falling off a cliff. There were lots of private pirate uh, uh, providers of music who were streaming stuff for free. And um, it took the music industry quite a while to wake up to um, uh, how to monetize the opportunities that this brought. Now, I'm sure that we will uh, now uh, see a further revolution, um, uh, again using the digital space, but using it in new ways in order to transmit creative content. It'll still be difficult for the film industry to put uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Joni in bed together um, uh, and um, uh, make a movie out of it. Um, uh, they will be able to be creative in how they deploy um, and depict um, interaction on screen between people um, who uh, otherwise have to be socially distanced. Um, uh, there will be new ways of um, uh, drawing people into the treasures of museums without actually stepping foot over the threshold. Um, it, there'll be a whole host of new things that develop. However, um, uh, and it is a very big however, there is absolutely no substitute for the thrill of being in the theatre with a play actually happening on the stage in front of you with the sweat running down the forehead of the actors uh, with uh, the sense of immediacy and presence that that, uh, that that brings. There is also no substitute for the thrill of seeing the real object, the real painting, not just an image, however wonderful that image may be. Um, uh, there is something about being in the presence uh, that um, is very special. And uh, I am fervently hoping that we will be able to get back to that um, in uh, the not too distant future. That's very much dependent on um, a vaccine coming along um, or new social measures being able to be put in place. I and mean, I, I, I do wonder whether or not, both in the context of, of the impact of digitization, but also in the context of COVID-19, a lot of that then therefore comes down to the response of government and how readily and how fleet of foot government can be in terms of putting new policies in place. One of the things that I consistently have heard over the years talking to ministers is that actually the difficulty is, is that the pace of change as far as this sector is concerned is difficult to be able to engage with and it's very difficult to get good advice from your civil servants because often they're caught up in the pace of change and don't quite know what to look for next. Are, are we moving into a period therefore potentially of, of, of turmoil and is that going to be a, a period that you think we will also be able to, in terms of the policy responses, in terms of being able to respond, uh, to respond and adjust? Uh, we are in a period of turmoil already, um, uh, not moving into it. Um, um, uh, I, the, one of the eternal problems uh, in this is that government is always playing catch up. Um, and uh, particularly in terms of the development of the digital sphere, um, uh, the government putting in uh, either regulation or enabling uh, provisions um, is always responding to yesterday's uh, uh, problem rather than tomorrow's problem, because none of us have any idea what tomorrow's problem is going to be. And uh, that will perennially be the case. 
what governments have to try and do is be as on the ball as possible, keeping up with what's uh, happening, um, having a reasonably flexible approach to things like regulation that uh, enable them to um, uh, adjust to changing circumstances and um, uh, listening uh, very frequently to what those who are involved in the industry itself have to tell them. I, I couldn't agree with you more that that is critical to my mind in terms of making this is a policy agenda space actually work, uh, getting that input in terms of uh, the issues that are coming down the line that people can see that their businesses and their practice is actually facing. And again, then allowing government to think about, well, how do we respond to this? But it is, it's, it's, it, it does mean that you need to have a better informed and a better trained civil service in that context, one that is perhaps far more fleet of foot than they would once have needed to be. Oh, that's certainly the case. Um, uh, and now having brought all of digital policy into DCMS, which was a, a really good uh, uh, development, um, there's a chance that you might get that. Um, uh, but um, uh, one thing I would say very firmly, and that is there is, I fear, a tendency on the part of government, and it's not just the UK government, it's other governments as well, um, to listen more attentively and pay more attention to uh, the purveyors of digital material, the, uh, the service uh, providers, um, the telecoms companies, the Facebooks and Googles of this world, than to the people who create the content. And uh, it's very important that governments listen to the people who create the content as well as the people who run the systems. Absolutely, because otherwise you end up with the most um, difficult imbalance to be able to, to manage at any stage um, where the creative sector is um, scrambling around hand to mouth and the profits, the large profits are going into the uh, te telecom companies or the, or, the or the social media companies rather than filtering down in actual fact to the creators who are developing the content. Yeah, absolutely. Does that, does that also mean therefore that we need to do some rethinking around the area of copyright and IP generally in terms of how we understand that and how rules are enforced? Because I still think that it is something which many people in the creative sector don't understand despite the fact that actually it's at the root of the way in which they not necessarily make their money on a on a day to day, but certainly if they're going to begin to make a, get a real return for what they do, they have to be leveraging against the intellectual property that they're creating. Um, uh, you know, most people in the creative sector don't understand it. Most people in most governments don't understand it. Yeah. Um, uh, whenever you start talking about intellectual property or copyright um, uh, in the House of Commons or the House of Lords, people's eyes glaze over and, um, uh, they're, they're, and they stop listening. Um, uh, there, there is a handful of members of the House of Lords, um, for example, who really know their stuff about copyright and intellectual property. Um, and uh, they know what they're talking about mm. and they are absolutely on the ball and interested. The vast majority of legislators are not. And uh, that I suspect is true uh, in most legislatures around the world. What you need to do is make absolutely sure that you have civil servants working in ministries around the world who are really clued up on this. Can we end by just going back to the issue of education? Because as we said very early on, um, education, education, education was the mantra of new labor originally. And I'm just wondering whether or not you think um, now what it is we need to change in terms of getting the education agenda right. We, we hear a lot of talk about STEM, about science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And I know that, for example, President Duque in Colombia has insisted that it should be STEAM and it's something, so you add arts into that, into that agenda. 
do you think that, that this is something that, that will ever actually be resolved? Do you think the arts can ever really find their place in the context of, of an education system? If it's, depending on what's driving that system, obviously, I mean, do we need to think very carefully about what's driving the education system to make sure that the arts and what they bring to the table and what culture and creativity brings to the table, both in terms of innovation, but also in terms of the development of our societies, how do we go about making sure that is properly there? It will always be a struggle um, uh, because there will be a natural tendency on the part of education ministries in particular, governments in general, to see science and technology as being the route to uh, uh, future economic success for their country. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, the, the, uh, the devotion to STEM um, uh, rather than STEAM um, with the arts added in is uh, something that uh, uh, I, I'm afraid is all too prevalent, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well. Um, the, one of the reasons for that is a perception of um, uh, economic utility in um, uh, science, technology, engineering. Um, but of course, what, the, uh, what an appreciation of the creative economy uh, brings to the table is economic utility for the arts as well. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, we need to carry on making that case uh, in order to broaden STEM into STEAM in the way in which um, uh, uh, education is promoted. Um, two other things uh, to, to say, however. Um, the first, one of the problems with a lot of our education in the UK is that uh, uh, at the, the age of four or five, a child is full of the ability to express themselves. Uh, they will love to sing, to dance, to paint, uh, to do creative things. And we then spend the next 10 years of their educational life trying to squeeze that creativity out of them. Uh, we, um, we tell them that it's, uh, it's logic and reason and knowledge and facts that are the uh, basis of a good education. And we don't continue to encourage alongside knowledge and reason and fact. We don't encourage the creative spirit to continue and to carry on expressing itself. Uh, with the result that to when they get to the age of 15 or 16 and they are thinking about what they want to do in the future, being creative is not necessarily the first thing that they will think about. And we need to uh, rebalance the way in which we do our education uh, as a result of that. Um, the other thing I'd say is those people who do manage to sustain a, uh, a creative spirit and who do then go on to set up an entrepreneurial uh, 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 little business uh, doing website design or um, uh, uh, some other form of uh, creative activity. Um, the problem is that no one has at any stage during the course of their education sat them down and said, this is what running a business is all about. Yes. And not just making sure that we nurture the creative spirit through the course of someone's schooling, but especially in art school or design school or uh, um, in uh, sixth form, um, uh, that we take creative spirits and explain to them how to run a business, that is another bit of the educational puzzle that we need to put in place. 
Chris, I'm going to, to end if that's okay by just asking you two questions. What is your one regret in terms of the things that you weren't able to do in government in terms of taking the creative economy agenda forward? Um, uh, get acceptance from the rest of government fast enough. It took such a long time and um, that we could have been doing all sorts of fantastic things in the course of those lost years. Um, I, I, most people got there in the end, but it, it took time and that's certainly a big regret. So you'd certainly be encouraging people in Colombia and other parts of the world who are working in this agenda to really try to galvanize that understanding within government. Yep, get on with it and, um, uh, and try and persuade other people in government and particularly key figures like a prime minister or a president or a finance minister, um, yeah, per persuade them uh, that this is important because if they start getting interested, then everything else will follow. And my final question is, what would you perceive your legacy to be in terms of the period of time that you're in government? Is it the creative economy or is it something else that you did that you feel most passionately about? Uh, whenever I'm asked this question, the first thing I say is um, uh, restoring free admission to all the national museums and galleries uh, because it was a, a wonderful thing to do. It is still in place. No subsequent government has dared to change it. It was incredibly popular, still is, and um, uh, it's something that I'm pretty proud about having done. The, the putting the creative economy on the map uh, would follow hard on its heels as uh, something I would say uh, uh, I would uh, like to be credited with. Chris, it's been as ever a great pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure that those people that are going to have the opportunities to listen and, and watch this are going to, I hope, take stuff from it, which will help them to think about how they progress the development of the creative economy in their own country. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.